All right, so we got a couple of Tacomas, new and old. We got a half ton Ram, we got a JK. How about you guys? Four Gen 4 Runner. Nice, get it. How about you? What do you drive? Four Gen Tundra. All right, we got a Toyota Crew, a little bit of Jeeps. Okay, so kind of what my, my thought is, something that doesn't get talked about a lot, is obviously there's differences in suspensions with solid axles and IFS, and we'll go into that a little bit, I think. Um, but I think today we're probably gonna talk more about the shocks and differences of shocks and why this one is 40 bucks <laughs> and this one is 4,000, right? Basically, so we got, everybody has an IFS rig except you, okay? So we all know IFS, independent front suspension, A-arms, um, like the Porsche, the only rig I have that's IFS, it's IRS also. You guys all have solid axle rear. Um, things that you should love about your cars is they're super forgiving, they're gonna be, pretty good on a gravel road when it comes to any sort of bumps, potholes, stuff like that. They're very forgiving because when one tire is able to move without upsetting the chassis, right? It's, it's all about your butt, how you're feeling your butt, right? Um, in stock format, they're okay. Obviously, as you, as you build them, if some of you guys have built them more, um, they should get better. It's really easy to make them worse with picking the wrong parts, but they should get better as far as off-road performance. Um, JK is totally different, obviously, solid axle. That's gonna do a lot better in the rocks. Um, harder to make that comfort comfortable on a logging road, but very doable. Um, so that being said, what we're trying to do to make, you know, when I look at a suspension, it's one thing to make it drive good down the road. Um, that's, you know, everybody says, well, I'm 50% off-road, bullshit. You're 1% off-road. A guy that off-roads a lot is 5%, right? Like, let's be honest, we all drive our cars. So it's gotta drive good down the road. That's Priority number one, um, and to get there, it's wildly different from a solid axle rig to an IFS rig of what we're gonna do to make it drive good. Um, IFS is, again, forgiving on the road, but can get real sketchy if, you know, specs aren't correct. Um, shock valving has less to do on-road in IFS than it's gonna do in the solid axle world. Um, but solid axle world, best thing we can do is add caster, as long as, Tires are square, you don't have camber issues, it needs caster, right? Like plus five or what, what Depends on tire size, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. I mean, that's got 38s and eight degrees. That's got 11 degrees and 42s. That's, the bigger the tire, the higher the, the yes. Tire. And what that's gonna do is, in the solid axle world, is if you can imagine walking on your toes, it'd be easy to kind of drift, right? But if you're walking flat footed, right? Lean back on your heels. Uh, a solid axle rig done right, I always tell people when they're Jeep, you know, they're like, oh, that's just how a Jeep drives. No, if you can't drive with one hand and reach in the back seat and grab your coffee and come back up and keep driving down the road, your Jeep isn't right. You know, and it's either loose parts or caster on a Jeep. Solid axle rig, the Ram, any of these, right? On your Toyota, right? Any of your, these IFS rigs, very different. Um, they're pretty forgiving. Like. In our world, we see a lot of Chevys that are blown out, like the front end, every single ball joint, every tie rod is loose. And the guy's like, oh, the thing drives great. They're super forgiving. The tires are doing this as you're going down the road, but it goes down the road easy as they get, right? It only gets better when stuff gets tight and right. So, um, but what we do have is ability to move the, in most IFS applications, the tire front to back and the wheel well, we can change camber, caster, toe, a lot more adjustable than in a solid axle rig and we can really make them, we can dial them in even more to make it want to go straight down the road, which is one thing, but also make it smooth. Um, being that it doesn't upset the chassis when you hit a bump, you're driving down the highway and you hit a pothole, solid axle rig is gonna fucking upset the whole car, right? IFS truck, it takes the hit and you keep going, right? Very different things. IFS loves to break off road, solid axle typically doesn't, right? So give and take for everything. Um, <laughs> I got, I got all of them. I got all, all the ways it's different, right? Different, what do you wanna do? Um, that being said, I mean, with adjustability, we can make a Ram half ton drive good, we can make a Toyota drive good, but they're pretty forgiving, they're gonna drive good. A lot of people say, oh, my Toyota drive's good enough. And they, we pull in the shop and it's got two loose tie rod ends, the rack bushings are loose and a bad ball joint. I'm like, well, it drives good. You're right, <laughs> it does. It's gonna break. <laughs> but on his Jeep, if something's loose, you know it. 
right? But it's a lot stronger. So um, any questions on suspension types? So do you, do you see like a certain threshold? I know every vehicle is going to be different, but everybody loves the puck spacers and everything, for the IFS rigs. Um, is there a threshold that you would recommend um, that's safe to do without changing out like upper control? On IFS? Uh, it has everything to do with the CV, yeah. right? Like different platforms have different CV angles where the CV likes to bind. Um, and, and obviously alignment specs like, you know, some rigs have an adjustable cam on the upper control arm and the lower control arm. Some are only lower control arm. So as you lift it, um, you have camber and toe change in IFS. And, you know, which causes bump steer, meaning you hit a bump and the steering wheel wiggles. You know, so as you lift a lot of those, it introduces bump steer. So that's what we're trying to get rid of. You know, we've all, a lot of us probably been in an IFS puck space truck and you hit a set of railroad tracks and the steering wheel wiggles. It drives good, it goes straight over the railroad tracks, but when you hit it, especially a diagonal railroad track, the steering wheel wiggles. That's bump steer, that's toe and cam camber change as it cycles, right? Um, it's just gonna add to that. Um, realistically, your spacer and all that is fine in a lot of applications if you think the factory ride is good enough, right? You come to a coilover, you can gain, gain ride, gain valving, and height, right? Um, so threshold is different on every, every vehicle, you know? You got some vehicles that can handle a half an inch before you start to you gain droop out of it and you have problems. Other vehicles can take four inches, right? The, those things over there, the Enos things are, they don't, can't really lift them other than like an inch and a half. Um, the pinion is screwed up on them, it's a problem, right? Um, depends on how they were built and, and what's in them. And those are solid axles, but they have, they have some problems there, you know? Um, so it's just vehicle specific for sure, you know? Um, but anybody doing an IFS lift, you should be trying to do a diff drop, make sure your CVs are happy, stuff like that. Um, right, Rob? <laughs> um, so, I mean, one thing that we're kind of set up here to talk about some shocks. I think that's something that a lot of people don't know near as much about. Um, why is my Icon Stage 10 on my Toyota better than the Bilstein 6112 kit? You know, they both do the same thing. It's both leveling kit height. The Icon one's six grand and the Bilstein one's 900, right? Like, what are we doing differently? And so we're going we're gonna to kind of stick to Toyota's, the IFS world for a little bit. We'll get back into the Jeep. Um, so you guys can see these shocks here. I'm gonna go over kind of what we got here. Um, stock Toyota shock, right? This is on every Tacoma, Tundra, this is a OE takeoff Hitachi shock. Um, Monotube like this, meaning little tiny piston. Piston, it's got oil going through it. It's got shims that deflect and that's your valving. Very basic, um, it controls shaft displacement um kind of <laughs> not very good um but gets the job done right um you move up to something like a rancho it's the same thing it's maybe a tiny bit bigger diameter but you cut it away it looks the same as that right it might be a little longer for your lift kit it might have you know a little better valving or something but it's the same shock as as this thing is extended pistons all the way down Thanks Rob for the exploded view of the shock. But as you compress your shock, you know, it's a hydraulic, right? This is a sealed zone. Um, you have hydraulic fluid in here. So as that shaft goes in there, it's disappearing, meaning it's filling this space. So this reservoir has a piston with air, call it air, it's nitrogen on this side of it. As this goes in, fluid is flowing through here and filling this up and moving this piston down and it's got nitrogen pressure that ramps up quickly to give it resistance. What that resistance does is a lot of things. One, it keeps the fluid from bubbling, basically foaming. Um, they call that cavitating. If your shock cavitates, you have no valving, right? If you put foamy water through a shim stack, hey, you have no control, right? Um, two, it's allowing this thing to actually compress and move. You can take, you know, that one's bad as internal bypass. So you can take the shock and compress it and it fully cycle the shock. This is a linear shock, meaning if I push it in an inch, it's gonna be the same resistance, the first inch and the last inch, 
with a little bit of difference because of the nitrogen ramp up inside of it, but you can run it all the way in. It's gonna extend. What's forcing it to extend is the nitrogen pressure in here, right? That's, there's not a spring or anything in there. The nitrogen pressure ramped up and it's extending. Um, same thing with this shock. Nitrogen expression is gonna push it back out. That's rebound, right? Compression, rebound. Um, still, this is a bad example of what I'm about to say. This shock is that shock, but a coilover. Take the spring off of it and it's a regular shock, right? It's linear, meaning it's gonna dissipate so much energy for every inch it compresses, right? Um, which is linear, linear, linear. You know, call it 100 pounds per inch, right? So if you have eight inches of travel, you can dissipate that much energy. Um, what you've seen in the Raptor world is an internal bypass shock. What you've seen, um, but before you get to an actual bypass, we're gonna talk about what a lot of people do. You've, we've all seen a fox with a clicker, right? Compression adjusters or stuff like that. Um, what that is doing is controlling the shaft displacement. This, this piston that's moving here, oil is traveling through. And if you control that shaft displacement at different speeds, you can actually get the sensation of wrapping up, ramping up valving or get the feel that you're dissipating more energy. You're driving your Tacoma and there's three whoops, you're hitting the brakes, right? If there's one, you might jam through it because you're gonna, you're gonna bottom the truck but it's either not gonna rebound or recover before the next bump, or it's gonna smash and it's gonna be into the bump stops and that's when you see people donking through bumps, right? But if you can dissipate that energy so you don't compress all the way through the suspension, the truck stays flat, right? You see it, trophy truck, ultra four car, that's 100 miles an hour through whoops and the tires are going crazy, right? They're dissipating that energy, right? They're not it's not that it's floating over the top of it. The tire may come off the ground, but it's dissipating the energy and it's all about the feel in the seat, right? You're, you gotta dissipate energy. That's what we're trying to do with a shock is dissipate energy. So um, you can do that with something like a Falcon or your compression adjusters, things like that, that are controlling that shaft displacement with a valve between basically the shock and the reservoir. Um, Falcons, I think miles ahead on how they do that with their adjusters. Um, you guys can, I'll pass this all around. You can see it. Um, if, if you go to one, it's open. There's a little valve here and on three, it's closed. What fluid is coming through this port and going into this reservoir on the top side of the piston as this compresses, that's going to come down. But if we put resistance on that ability to compress, we're at adding more valving more or less, right? So you guys can pass this around. You can see it kind of move. It's kind of cool. Falcon does a really cool job of that. Um, that's a great cutaway. Falcon um, is what is on van, van compass stuff. Um, endless amounts of hours on valving and making it work correctly. Um, and that's, that's not progression in the suspension, but that's, that's more control and adjustable control. Um, Pretty cool way it works. Really nice internals in a Falcon. Different than I wish I had like a King, like if you cut this shock away, this shock costs four times what that shock costs, right? Um, this is what is on a trophy truck going hundred miles an hour through the desert. That shock has way nicer internals than this. As far as hard anodized internals, billet parts, the quality machine is, is very nice in that shock. I'm not, this is my own personal shock. I'm not bashing my own stuff. It's just different. Um, this is a race shock. It's got Viton seals. It is a race shock. You're gonna, if you run a thousand miles in the desert, the shock gets rebuilt, right? And the, the fluid is black and stinks like ass and the seals are burnt and it's a problem, but it goes very fast. Um, and I'll go over the reasons why. Um, again, that's a linear shock. There's, there's more tech in that shock that I'm gonna let Rob go over. Shock's best investment you can make with the Overland crowd, how much weight gets added. A tuned shock is going to be absolutely everything you can do. There's a bunch of companies that will tune it custom. AccuTune is a good example. Falcon does a lot of like zone specific tuning and they spend a ton of time. They, they make a lot of Toyota kits and Ram kits and Ford kits. They spend a ton of time in tuning before it ever hits production. A lot of the other companies, Fox, King, they just 
one lap around the block, yeah, it's a little better than stock, and then they send it. So that's where aftermarket companies like Shock Surplus and AccuTune go to those guys, tell them the weight of your vehicle so that it's internal tuning is everything. I mean, the style of driving you do. that too. Yeah. I mean, rooftop tent, no rooftop tent. I mean, a four or 500 pound difference, it's infinitely adjustable with shocks. It's, it's, it really is. So Falcon stuff's nice with the adjustability, that base valve, that's what's in the adjuster that has a giant range of adjustment but you still got to nail that main tune on the main piston in order for it to really ride awesome day to day. So even if you just get a mono tube, non-adjustable, I mean, it's amazing how good you can get a 2.0 Fox to ride if it's tuned for the weight of the vehicle and specific to the vehicle. So if you're going to do anything, don't just throw a ton of money at a blingy King. If it's just straight from King, it's going to ride, it's going to ride different from stock. It might not ride better, to be brutally honest. Same with Fox, same with the Bilstein stuff's actually pretty impressive. They spend a lot of time tuning before it gets production, but there's companies out there, like I said, AccuTune's a good one. And I don't know if you guys do revalves and tunes. Some, uh, but I've seen it Don't just throw money at the best icon, stage eight or whatever. Just make sure you get it tuned specific to your vehicle and what you kind of do. Yeah, if you buy like a, a King 2.5 from AccuTune, it's, it's the same price as if you buy it anywhere else, but it's actually going to come valved for exactly for your truck. Yeah, they have 25 questions about your Yeah. Hey, you go get a scale weight, act, like actually get a cat scale weight on it. Tell them what you're doing. Percentage of dirt road versus on road. You know, a lot of time, like he kind of said earlier, most, most of the time you're on the road. So why valve, the sh why, why valve your truck for running through like Barstow, Maine? It's going to ride like everywhere else. And then, when you're on the when you're on the highway, it's just awful. It's so stiff. It's so firm. I feel every chatter. But yeah, it's bitching for that one section of desert that you never go to. Like, okay, cool. So just those are the things to think about. I think a lot of that gets lost in marketing and the blinginess of a lot of like aftermarket shock companies. Shock shaft. You know, you can move it real slow. Like you can push down on this shock like here, and like I can move it. But if I try to move that fast, it's velocity sensitive. A bypass is position sensitive. That's what all the tubes are. It changes depending on where it is in the stroke of the shock. So that adds a whole other level of complexity and tends to add noise too, because you got more internal component, components moving. To explain bypass, again, you have your piston. Right now it's up here. Um, it's probably right here, right? So as it droops out, you have rebound and compression adjustable tubes and it's allowing fluid to bypass around the valving, right? And that's adjustable with these adjusters. You're able to control how much fluid bypasses, meaning how much fluid goes through the piston, how much of it is controlled on compression and rebound. It's got all the same stuff going. It's also, this is a bottom hose shock. All of these shocks, the hose of the reservoir comes off the top. But what we found is if you're getting it through the desert, as you compress everything, the spring then throws that axle down really fast and the fluid now has to come out of here and, and follow the piston down right and it'll cavitate creating a vacuum and that foams the fluid so then as soon as you hit that next bump you have nothing to dampen because it's foam so a bottom hose shock is filling the bottom side of the piston so on rebound you have a lot you have a lot more control it's you know it's, it's already flowed but you can't do a bottom hose on a coilover because you got a spring in the way <laughs> like so you, you have things to go around but so this is creating adjustable position sensitive valving meaning you know the the valving is going to get stiffer as we compress more which means we can dissipate more energy meaning we're not going to feel it as much in our butt meaning you can go faster because you don't feel like you're breaking your truck um, what they do in a bypass like on a raptor is they do that all internally this actually has like two shocks inside of it so Inside here, if you take this top cap off, you pull the valving out, there's another cylinder in here. And so this is a 2.5 shock. It's got more or less like a 2.0 piston in it that slides inside of a tube. That tube has holes in it and allows fluid to bypass around the valving. All done internally, not near as much noise as something like that. But this is what comes, this is why Raptors get it off-road, is because they have position-sensitive position, position sensitive valving built into the truck, front and rear. So it's got internal bypasses front and rear. Um, really cool 
King and Fox both do this. I mean, everybody does it now. They both have approached it differently, which I think is cool. They both didn't do the same thing. They approached how they did it differently. Um, Fox got the Raptor contract and we rebuild these every 40,000 miles on every Raptor. If you want a Raptor, remember, you have to rebuild your shocks every 40,000 miles or the truck completely falls apart and drives terrible. And it's just shock valving. Remember that when you go to buy a Raptor. <laughs> um, then we haven't really talked about our coilover is a shock, typically linear, but you can have an internal bypass coilover, but it's got the springer on the outside. Spring obviously holds up the truck. It's leveraged. You got A-arms or tires out here. Um, adjustable, height adjustable. So technically your leveling kit can be built into this. You put a bumper on the front, lowers the front down. We can add a little preload, bring it back up to stock height, stuff like that. Um, there's bypass versions, there's compression adjusters, there's, you know, endless amounts. Have you, seen, uh, have you ever seen a cutaway of a DSC and how they're able to do mm -hmm. those separately? Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a valve stack in it. How is it just a different stack that you adjust like with your low speed and high speed knobs? Uh, yeah, more or less. I mean, you got a valve stack in the compression adjuster. When you can, you can push past this, like low speed is this, right? Low speed. And so they can set valving so the valving doesn't even crack. It's bypassing the valving when you're doing that. High speed, it tries to move so much fluid, it cracks a valve, right? Because it can't bypass a valve. So, and they can adjust that. Um, that's more or less what they're doing. But remember, this valve, this, the piston on here has a lot of valving in it, right? The only thing we're controlling with any sort of adjuster is shaft displacement, which is this amount of shaft going in. So you have far less control because you're only controlling the shaft displacement. You're not controlling the amount of fluid going through the shaft. So like, you know, in some degrees, the clickers are in, in like a king or a fox. I'm kind of like, God, you got to be really sensitive to want to spend the money for that because uh, most people can't feel it. I'm like, do a 10 click adjustment or you won't feel anything, right? Falcon does it and they, the way they control it is huge movements and it's much more noticeable. Like all the vans we do, um, I mean, it's, it's huge ranges of adjustment, even though it's just shaft displacement. Um, but you're still, you still got a shim stack and you're still controlling shaft displacement. A coilover has a linear spring. No one makes, not no one, but it's a linear spring. Um, Jeeps, they make a lot of progressive springs, right? So now you can get a progressive spring and if you can get a bypass or something like that, you can get a lot of progression. And I mean, we built a ton of Jeeps that get it. I mean, you, that Jeep right there with internal bypasses gets it through the desert. I mean, 40, 50 miles an hour through the bumps, it rips, but it's got tuning, you know, it's good base valves, tuned at King, good spring rate, like good weight distribution, stuff like that. But bring to your JK, that's all been done, right? You wanna make your JK get it in the desert? We can just buy off the shelf parts and get really good, right? We, you just, you don't want to buy this if you're going to go get it in the desert. You want to drive it down the street, this is probably fine, right? It just depends on what you want to do. So you want to think about that when you're picking your components for what you're going to do. And also realize that if you, it's my first Overland rig or my first Jeep, right? Is my family going to love it? Am I going to do it more? Or is it going to peter out? You can never really realize that, but... Do it once, do it right, right? Like I have this conversation every day with people at the shop. They're like, I wanna build my axles in my Jeep. I'm like, okay. Like, let's have this conversation about where you're going. What's your end goal? Is your end goal 35s and dirt wheeling? Yeah, we should, let's build your axles. But if your end goal is like, I wanna go do sledgehammer, sell your axles, let's put one tons in it. Do it once, save the money. It's more money up front, but it saves you money in the long run. Same thing with your suspension. If you know what your kind of goal is. Yeah, guest appearance by Stanton. <laughs> so I, I'm a big kind of believer that do it once, do it right. It's hard to predict where you're going and what you're gonna do with your truck. But if you can, do it right the first time. There go. There's a few things we know about shocks and suspension. If you learned something great, if not, ask your question, I'm happy to answer. <laughs>